it goes. Okay, guys, we are back on Refuge Recovery, Buddhist Path to Recovering from Addiction by Noah Levine. We are on Honesty. I believe this is 11. Part 11, page 58. As addicts, many of us have had to lie and steal to cover up our addictions. Many of us were lying and stealing even before we became addicts. And for some, lying and stealing was part of what we were addicted to. As we commit to recovery, we commit to honesty. The path of recovery demands honesty, rigorous honesty. Let's see. The path of recovery demands honesty. You're unlikely to have much success in recovering if you can't even begin to tell the truth. Recovery begins when we honestly admit to our addictions and then make the conscious commitment to abstinence. Without honesty, the recovery process cannot truly pro proceed. Some people may be able to maintain periods of abstinence while continuing to lie, to cheat, and steal. But most will find that the karma of dishonesty will catch up with them in the forms of guilt, shame, and remorse. And this will often lead to relapse or continued addiction. We are trying to rebuild our lives, the lives torn apart by addiction, by suffering. We are trying to rebuild our lives, the lives torn apart by addiction, to build a solid foundation for our future, for a life of wisdom and compassion. Dishonesty must be abandoned. Stealing has many forms of forms and connotations. There is the obvious cash register definition, which means to blatantly steal money. Hi, Katie. <laughs> Stealing has many forms of renunciations. There is the obvious cash register re definition, which means to blatantly steal money or material goods from people. For most of us, this is not a huge problem. For some, however, it is a major temptation. Then there are the less obvious forms of stealing, like taking more than your share of something that was freely offered. For example, you pocket you pocket a few extra sugars at the office, at the coffee shop, or bring home with to bring home with you, or you steal the pen at the bank, or you line your pockets with plastic bags at the buffet and take an extra meal home with you. Or you do what I did a couple of weeks ago when they were closing up the parks due to coronavirus. We were literally there when they were putting up the, the you guys can't be here signs. Um, I, I took a bunch of doggy bags, poop bags, because they were there. So that's what that makes me think of. So we're, I, I for one, am, I did that, so that was wrong. Then there are the non-material forms of stealing. For example, some people try to steal all of our attention. They are the attention vampires who suck the life out of us. The self-centered people who constantly corner us and try to take us hostage into personal dramas. For all know, we all know people like this. And many of us have probably been guilty of the same thing. How many times have you stolen someone else's time and energy? Lying can also take a different forms. There is the outright lie. Intentionally saying something that is false. Then there is embellishment, intentionally exaggerating or overselling something. The big fish story, the I had a $2,000 a day habit tale, tall tales. Then there is the diminishing lie, when we tell only the partial truth or we lessen the severity of that, that I only did it a couple of times line or I only lost a little money partial truth or that it wasn't that bad qualification. Then there are the lies of omission. These are the true events or thoughts that we simply don't share. Perhaps you fail to tell your spouse about how much money you spent or how much you earn, or you fail to mention you had lunch with your ex or sex with another. Lies of omissions allows us to delude others into believing something that is not true or allow them to believe something about us that is not so. Oh, that hurts or allow them to believe something about us that is not so. All dishonesty has karmic consequences, and that karma could lead us to relapse. So we abstain from all forms of dishonesty to support our recovery. Like it or not, there you are. Refrain from sexual misconduct. 
Most addicts who come into recovery have some wounds regarding sexuality. Sex is a powerful, natural human energy. When we approach sex in a healthy way, it can be a source of great connection and joy. <laughs> when we approach sex in an unhealthy way, however, it becomes a deep source of suffering. Some of our members have become addicted to sex. Others have forsaken it altogether. For the sex addict, creating one's own healthy ideals, bottom line behaviors, and parameters will be necessary. For the rest of us, the simple guidelines of honesty and integrity in our sexual relationships are sufficient. This means refusing to engage in sexual activity with people who are committed, who are in committed relationships with others, refraining from cheating on our partners, and only engaging in sexual activities with people who are age appropriate and willing participants. This is all basic common ethical behavior. But many addicts turn from drugs, alcohol, or other addictions to sex as their next fix. And when sex becomes recreational, well, people start to lose sight of ethics and responsibility. For many, periods of abstinence or celibacy will be part of the recovery process. Sometimes stepping away from sex altogether is necessary to heal. But in general, our attitude towards sex is go for it as consensual adults. But you also need to accept the consequences. Enjoy all the pleasure and intimacy that sex brings, but be awake. Remember the truth of impertinence that you are going to change and your partner is going to change and you're probably not going to like it. Be willing to suffer the consequences of impertinence and go into it with your eyes open. All relationships end even happily ever after ends with death and loss. Next chapter here is forgiveness, page 61. Forgiveness is an action, the act of letting go of hatred and ill will towards others. We have explored the process and understanding of forgiveness in the first factor, is in the first factor of the path. But this is where we put our understanding into action. A regular and consistent practice of, the for, of forgiveness meditation will be necessary. Even just 10 to 15 minutes a day of asking for and offering forgiveness in your meditation will train your mind and heart to let go and allow you to be free from the suffering of resentment. For addicts, it is necessary to take forgiveness a step further. While doing the inner work of letting go, we must also take direct relational action. The process of releasing the hearts and minds grasp on past pains and betrayals almost always includes taking responsibility by making amends and offering forgiveness when it is appropriate and welcomed. Very often this includes communication with those whom we have harmed as well as those who have harmed us. This direct communication is the relational aspect of forgiveness, making amends in a healing and is a healing and generous act. This in no way means that we have to reconcile with people who have harmed us or that we should subject ourselves or others to further abuse. Part of the forgiveness and healing process is to create healthy boundaries. We may forgive someone, but choose never to interact with that person again. We must not confuse letting go of your past injuries with feeling an obligation to let the injurers back into our life. The freedom of forgiveness often includes a firm boundary and loving distance from those who have harmed us. We may likewise need to keep a loving distance from those whom we have harmed to keep them from further harm. To that extent, this practice of letting go of the past and making amends of our behaviors is more internal than relational. We can like, Kitty. Um, to that extent, the practice of letting go of the past and making amends for our behavior is more internal than relational. We can let individuals back into our hearts without ever letting them back into our lives. We have 
the list of people you have harmed and been harmed by from the first truth inventory. Take another look at it. And with the guidance and support of your mentor, begin making amends for your behaviors. And if anybody needs help with that, um, you can contact me uh, on the comments and we can figure out a way to communicate, like on Messenger or something. I'd be totally jazzed to be able to do that for someone. Action and engagement. Guiding principles. And we're at 10 minutes. Yay, so we'll continue on. As recovering addicts, we are embarking on a spiritual path. This path consists of being wise and compassionate in our attitudes and actions. Through meditation, participation in community, and practicing of the principles outlined in the Fourth Noble Truths, we will come into integrity and become honest and truth trustworthy again. Kindness will become our guiding principles. The way and Kindness, whenever I, I keep reading the word kindness, what I keep getting out of that, I don't know why I feel the need to say it, is kindness means there's no confusion. People are on the same page. I think in my soul, my higher self is telling me that's where a lot of the kindness gets skewed. And that's why kindness starts to, uh, I start looking at kindness sideways because there's confusion amidst it. And then it's like, well, how do you trust that? I don't know why that just keeps coming up. Like, I imagine it's because I'm not the only one that deals with that sort of reality. And a reality just needs to be, have some rigorous truth put into it. And the other person may not like it, but rigorous truth. And as an individual, you may be too chicken shit to do it, but rigorous truth, rigorous truth. The way that we use the term kindness is in the context of what will end suffering and help us to recover in each situation. So that kind of goes with it, yeah. The next kind action depends on the circumstances. The kind thing to do is the skillful response in each given moment. For instance, when it comes to pleasurable experiences, the kind relationship to pleasure is always non-attached appreciation. Non-attached appreciation non-attached appreciation i guess the thing that even though that's my goal the thing with me is that i'm just like that feels almost robotic or like there's some sort of distance between the hearts uh, non-attached appreciation like we're always going to be in our own individual bubbles but if we're all one then you know so yeah, dissonance, I'm getting dissonance on that one. Even though I know that my soul tells me that's the best way to go about life so that you don't end up suffering. Not attached appreciation. Uh, the whole goal has been not to be an island, but to be part of something, to have a family, to, to have a community, to be part of something together with other people, but none attached appreciation. Maybe it's not in this lifetime that we're supposed to be that fully, not until we escape this 3D-ness, this planet, uh, this time and matter matrix. <laughs> I don't know. What do you guys think? If we can enjoy the pleasurable moments without engaging in clinging to them or getting caught in the craving for them to last forever, then we can avoid typical suffering we often create around pleasure. So the kind thing to do is not to get attached. Kitty, I'm really attached to you. Did you know that? Yeah. Means I take care of you and I watch out for you. And I make sure that nothing ever happens to you that can hurt you, kill you. But she's an animal. Maybe I should just put all that attachment into my pets. And... But pets come and go too, of course. Yes, a lot to focus on in this book. I'd like to share these little moments of dissonance with you so that you understand that. I understand. <laughs> this is a lot. That these four noble truths are asking of us, isn't it? 
If you can enjoy the pleasurable moment without clinging to them or getting caught in the craving for them to last forever, then we can avoid the typical sufferings we often create around pleasure. So the kind thing to do is not to get attached. As if we were not able to meet the pleasure with non-attachment appreciation, and if we have already become attached, then the kind thing to do is to let it go. Which may mean a practice of renunciation or abstinence. And the next level of kindness that is often called for is patience with ourselves as we learn to let go. So then patience becomes another act of kindness. And when our minds start judging us for not being very good at letting go, we respond with forgiveness. Forgiveness then is also an act of kindness. Get the picture? <laughs> the kind of thing to do depends on the situation. When it comes to painful experiences, the kind thing to do is to meet experience with compassion. Compassion ends suffering. It does not end pain, but it does take care of the extra level of suffering. We tend to layer on top of our pain. Mm, I like that. True that. I'm going to repeat that. When it comes to painful experiences, the kind of the kind thing to do is to meet experience with compassion. Compassion and suffering. It does not end pain, but it does take care of the extra level of suffering we tend to layer on top of our pain. And in that way, the kindest thing we can do is to cultivate tolerance and compassion towards pain. One of the situations where kindness become one of the situations where kindness becomes tricky is when we are faced with the possibility that our seemingly kind actions could actually be causing some harm, that we could be enabling someone to suffer more through our intentions to be kind. Hmm, tricky. For instance, in the case of dealing with a friend or family member who is actively engaged in addiction, at some point in the relationship, a strong boundary is going to have to be set. While lending money to a friend, in many cases, could be seen as a generous or kind act. With the addict, it could actually cause more harm than good. Most of us face this dilemma on some level or another on a regular basis when asked for money on the street by someone who appears to be homeless and intoxicated. And giving in a way that may very well lead to further addiction and suffering actually an act is, is that actually an act of kindness at all? In some cases, the kindest thing we can do is to say no. Sometimes kindness means telling an individual the truth that they may not want to hear. At times, kindness may even hurt. Kindness doesn't ever have the intention of causing harm, but perhaps in some situations, it just, well, it's just unavoidable. Most of the time, our kindness will be felt and appreciated. Most of the time, people will come to love, appreciate, and feel safe around us due to our commitment to kindness. I'm going to repeat that because I think that's what we all seek. Most of the time, our kindness will be felt and appreciated. Most of the time, people will come to love, appreciate, and feel safe around us due to our commitment to kindness. That's tricky. It's tricky for me. Because then I'm here in this book to try to learn about the difference between being kind and being a doormat. And feel safe around us. I want to feel safe around someone. <laughs> around a whole com community. Don't we all? All our actions are important and permanent to our recovery and spiritual awakening. All our actions are important and permanent to our recovery and spiritual awakening. As we become honest with ourselves, others will experience the joy of blamelessness. As we forgive ourselves and others and make amends to those who have caused harm, we will come to know the peace of mind and heart that is the happiness of debtlessness. Yeah, you're no longer in debt. Debtlessness. And freedom from ill will. When we are wise and careful with our sexuality, 
you create both internal and external safety. That's something I need to work on. When we are wise and careful with our sexuality, we create both internal and external safety. By not causing harms to ourselves or others, we create solid foundations of our recovery. Or as a friend of mine would say, keep it in your pants. For the mailer. Keep your pants up or skirt up or whatever. Okay, we are at 20 minutes and we will continue on with livelihood slash service, which is chapter nine in the next chapter. And that will be page 65 of Refuge Recovery by Noah Levine. Namaste. Much love to you guys.